Maya Angelou is probably one of the most respected figures through history, right? Her name alone exudes elegance, class, and sophistication and intelligence. She is called the people's poet, and that she is indeed. But with so much respect, you know, with a story that is so intense and moving, like every documentary or piece of work I've read from her moves me. People are very protective of Maya Angelou. There's a lot of things that people don't really want to highlight or talk about with her life, even though Maya Angelou herself was not ashamed of it like her past as a sex worker she was not ashamed of it she spoke about it so that she could be a positive influence and show people not to be ashamed of their past etc and be human and relatable but I hate now how her legacy and her story people like get mad about that it's really weird but we're going to talk about some of those things in her life all of the autobiographies that she has written about her life meaning that she wanted her life to be a source of inspiration for people to be like this is where i came from they literally started from the bottom and now i'm here she's a true definition of that a very iconic woman legendary and there will never be another maya angelou we're going to get into her story but first hey friend welcome to my channel Crane allude where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars through history if you're not yet subscribed please be sure to do so and if you're already subscribed please turn on your notification bell so you never miss out an upload now without further ado let's get into this video let's start first with her childhood so the renowned Maya Angelou originally named Marguerite Annie Johnson was welcomed into the world on April 4th 1928 she was a second child of Bailey Johnson a native dietitian who also worked as a doorman and Vivian Baxter Johnson who was as a nurse and car dealer. Maya's older brother, Bailey Jr., gave her the nickname Maya, which is a sweet shortening of my or Maya sister. When their parents' marriage failed, Maya and her brother at the tender age of three and four were sent all alone on a train journey to Stamps, Arkansas. There, they lived with their grandmother, Annie Henderson. Despite the challenging economic times faced by African Americans, their grandmother managed to thrive financially during the Great Depression and World War II. She did so by running a general store that sold essential goods and making smart, honest investment. And it probably was one of the best things for Maya to go live with her grandmother at that time because she really instilled a lot of values in them but can you imagine how tragic it is for your parents to ship both you and your brother on a train during that era <laughs> the civil rights movement wasn't even there yet okay kids that are not even 10 years old yet you put them on a train to go to live with your mother and she felt an immense sense of rejection i was three years old when my brother bailey five my father and mother had agreed to disagree and neither of them wanted the problems of having two toddlers. So they put us on a train and sent us from Los Angeles to Arkansas with tags on our arms. No adult supervision. I thought it was the worst thing when I just declared my mother dead so that I wouldn't have to long for her. Yes, that was terrible rejection. So with her grandmother though, they did face a lot because it was really deep in the South and there was just a lot of trauma there dealing with the KKK. It was just intense. The Klan would ride down the hill toward the store. We had to hide Uncle Willie. Because a white girl could say, well, he made an attempt to touch me. We had to help Uncle Willie to get down in the bin. And we'd cover him with potatoes and onions. So she did end up going back to live with her mother and her mother was already dating another guy after that and at the age of eight a traumatic event took place in Maya's life. She was sensually taken advantage of, touched without her permission by her mother's boyfriend Freeman. After revealing this horrifying incident to her brother, Freeman was found guilty but was only imprisoned for a single day. Upon his release, he was taken out of here, likely by Maya's uncles. He was found dead. And then at about six or seven, my father took me and my brother Bailey back to St. Louis to my mother. My mother's boyfriend was intoxicated with my mother. In his rage at his inability to control her, he raped me. I was seven. I told the name of the rape to my brother, who was nine. I said, I can't tell you his name because he said he would kill you. He said, I won't let him. The man was put in jail for one day and night and released. And a few days later, the police came to my mother's mother's house and said the man had been found dead. And it seemed he'd been kicked to death. My seven-year-old logic told me that my voice had killed the man. I stopped speaking for five years. I clamped my teeth shut. I'd hold it in. If I talked to anyone else, that person might die too. 
I had to stop talking. This led Maya to remain silent for nearly five years, haunted by the belief that her voice had caused Freeman's death. It was during this silent period that she developed an incredible memory, a deep love for books and literature, and a keen sense of observation. So she really stopped talking in that point to the point where her mother thought that she was, that's the word that was used, I'm not trying to be offensive, but you know, retarded or mute and wasn't going to have much value to life. So her mother once again sent her and her brother to live with her grandmother again. But her grandmother, like she said, would always tell her and speak life into her and say, one day you're going to be a preacher. You're going to be speaking all over the world. I know you can speak. You know, her grandmother, like I said, really encouraged and instilled a lot of values into her. And eventually, a significant figure in Maya's life, Ms. Bertha Flowers, who was a family friend and teacher, helped her regain her voice. She introduced Maya to the works of renowned authors like Charles Dickens, William Shakespeare, Edgar Allan Poe. These authors, along with Black female artists like Frances Harper and Spencer and Jessie Fawcett, greatly influenced Maya's life and career. At 14, Maya and her brother moved back in with their mother again, it was just back and forth, who had since relocated to Oakland, California. During World War II, Maya attended the California Labor School, and at the age of 16, she became the first black female streetcar conductor in San Francisco. Shortly after finishing school, Maya gave birth to her son, Clyde, who later changed his name to Guy Johnson at the age of 17. And I like how blunt she was with it, even in her autobiography, she says straight up, this guy wanted to sleep with me for the longest and I'll just one day walk up to him and say hey you still want to hit <laughs> I mean not like that but you know PG-13 for YouTube and she said hey they went he had a key to his friend's apartment they did what they did she got pregnant when her mom came and was questioning her do you love him she was like no now mom said okay we're not gonna ruin two lives so we'll keep the child but you don't have to marry him and that was the end of that okay but I love how real she was she never sugarcoated anything and at the age of 18, Maya Angelou moved to California from Arkansas, hoping to make a new life for her and her son. She held a series of jobs as a cook and a waitress before becoming a madam for a gay couple two women. The brothel business was very lucrative for Maya, but short-lived after a disagreement with the couple, fearing arrest and losing custody of her son, Maya Angelou returned to California, this time engaging in the business as a sex worker herself. First, it's important to note that Dr. Angelou wasn't ashamed of her, you know, work. My mother was working in nightclubs at the time. I got jobs in strip joints. I didn't strip, but then I didn't have to. In fact, she said the following, and I quote, I wrote about my experience because I thought too many people tell young girls or young folks, I never did anything wrong. Who, moi, never I have no skeletons in my closet. In fact, I have no closet. <laughs> They lie like that and then young people find themselves in situations and they think, damn, I must be a pretty bad guy. My mom or dad never did anything wrong. They can't forgive themselves and go on with their lives. So I wrote the book gathered together in my name, end quote. In the 1950s, Maya Angelou's life became a whirlwind of love, dance, and activism. In 1951, she tied the knot with Tosh Angelos, a Greek electrician who once served as a sailor and was trying his hand at music. Their union was met with raised eyebrows, given the societal disapproval of interracial relationships in those days. And even Maya's mother had her reservations, but love won and they got married. And during this time, Maya's feet found rhythm in modern dance classes. There she met Alvin Ailey, and Ruth Beckford, two famous dancers and choreographers. She teamed up with Ailey and they named their dance duo Al and Rita. They became a sensation in San Francisco, performing modern dance at gatherings of black fraternities. And her marriage eventually ended with Tosh in 1954. But the sad thing is also that there is a story that Maya Angelou's son gave where Maya was trying to be the understudy for Pearl Bailey, which I did a video for and I love Pearl Bailey so much. So this one broke my heart to know this story i was like oh no i'll pin pearl bailey's video in the comments but apparently you know maya was trying to be her understudy and work under her and you know find some stability she wasn't yet the maya angelou you know with all the respect and who she was just trying to make it man hustling and doing a lot of sacrifices and guess what pearl bailey was like i don't want this ugly girl working with me this big ugly girl being my understudy and that broke maya angelou's heart so bad my mother had a chance to do the understudy in hello dolly 
with Pearl Bailey as the lead, and it was regular money. The director and the producer both loved her, but Pearl Bailey came back and said, oh no, I ain't gonna have this big old ugly girl be my understudy. There are very few times in my life that I remember my mother crying because this meant she had to go back out on the road and find other work. It was devastating because I knew all the sacrifices my mother made. 35 years later, when Pearl Bailey was getting a lifetime award and they asked her, who do you want to give it to you? She said, by Angelo. <laughs> and guess who gave it to her and never said a damn thing? <sighs> so now you see how the story goes. Sometimes God will make your enemies your footstool. <laughs> In this instance, Maya Angelou became so big that Pearl Bailey didn't even remember that this was the woman that she rejected and called too ugly. And this is who she wanted to present her award. And what a classy, beautiful woman that Maya Angelou was to not even bring it up. She just gave that award. It's a testament of her character personality. Maya then began to perform professionally in various clubs around San Francisco. One such place was the Purple Onion, where she grooved to Calypso music, at that time, people knew her as Margarita Johnson or Rita, but her managers at the Purple Onion suggested a change. They felt Maya Angelou, a combination of her nickname and her former husband's surname, had a unique ring to it. It mirrored the energy of her Calypso performances. And between 1954 and 1955, Maya toured Europe with a production of the opera Porgy and Bess. She made it a point to learn the language of every country she visited. Over time, she became fluent in several languages, just a brilliant woman. In 1957, she rode the wave of Calypso's popularity and recorded her first album, Miss Calypso. In 1959, Maya met novelist John Oliver Killens. He encouraged her to move to New York to focus on her writing career. She joined the Harlem Writers Guild, where she rubbed shoulders with notable African-American authors like John Henrik Clark, Rosa Guy, Paul Marshall, and Julian Mayfield. It was here that her writing got published for the first time. In 1960, Maya's life took another turn when she met Martin Luther King Jr., the civil rights leader. Inspired by his speech, she and Killens organized a cabaret for freedom to raise funds for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The year 1961 was a turning point for Maya Angelou. She showcased her acting prowess in Jean Genet's play, The Blacks, where she played the role of the queen. That same year, she crossed paths with Vusamsi Maki, a South African activist fighting against apartheid. While they never formalized their relationship through marriage, their bond was strong enough to lead to a significant relocation. In an adventurous move, Maya, together with her son Guy and Mackie, relocated to Cairo, Egypt. However, by 1962, her relationship with Mackie ended. This led to another move, this time to Ghana, so Guy could attend college. Unfortunately, Guy was involved in a severe car accident, which prolonged their stay in Ghana as he recovered. During this extended years in Ghana, Maya didn't just sit idly. She took up a job as an administrator at the University of Ghana and immersed herself in the African-American expatriate community. She became a feature editor for the African Review, a freelance writer, and worked for Radio Ghana. Her creative streak also found expression at Ghana's National Theater, where she performed regularly. She even reprised her role in a revival of the Blacks in Geneva and Berlin. While in Ghana, Maya developed a close friendship with Malcolm X during his visit in the early 1960s. When she returned to the U.S. in 1965, she intended to assist him in building a new civil rights organization, the Organization of Afro-American Unity. But fate had other plans. Malcolm X was sadly taken out of here, leaving her devastated. Seeking solace, she joined her brother in Hawaii and resumed her singing career. She later moved back to Los Angeles to focus on her writing skills after acting in and writing plays, she returned to New York in 1967. A year later, Martin Luther King Jr. asked Angelou to organize a march, but in a cruel twist of fate, King was assassinated on her 40th birthday. This loss also left her devastated. Despite having almost no experience, Angelou wrote, produced, and narrated Blacks, Blues, Black. This 10-part series of documentaries explored the connection between blues music and Black Americans. She accepted a challenge from Random House editor Robert Loomis. She penned her first autobiography, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, published in 1969. This book brought her international recognition and acclaim. Finally, in 1972, Angelou's Georgia, Georgia was released. Produced by a Swedish film company and filmed in Sweden, this was the first screenplay produced by a black woman. Maya Angelou made a lot of people shocked when they found out that she had married the same white man not once, but three times. This man was none other than Paul Dufour. 
a Brit known for his skills as a construction worker and painter. He even had a stint as a bear model in a British cosmopolitan magazine. Angelou and Dufeu opened up about their unlikely love story in a 1975 interview with People magazine, recalling their first encounter. Angelou said, this tall, handsome Englishman came up and asked if I were alone. When she confirmed she was, he complimented her, calling her the most beautiful woman in the world and asked her out to dinner on the spot. From that day forward, the couple spent every night together unless work commitments got in the way. The love between Angelou and Dufay was so intense that they decided to tie the knot three times. When asked why they married each other multiple times, Angelou simply responded that their love for one another was that profound. Despite their strong bond, Angelou and Zufu eventually parted ways in 1981. Now, from the 1970s to the early 2000s, Maya Angelou's life was an exhilarating whirlwind of achievements and milestones. During this period, Angelou's creativity knew no bounds. She composed music for renowned singer Roberta Flack and put together scores for movies. Her writing portfolio expanded to include articles, short stories, TV scripts, documentaries, autobiographies, and poetry, showcasing her versatility as a writer. She also produced plays and taught at various colleges and universities as a visiting professor. She earned a Tony Award nomination in 1973 for her performance in Look Away. Four years later, she appeared in a blockbuster television miniseries, Roots, playing a supporting role that further established her presence in the entertainment industry. Her circle of influence also expanded during this time when she met Oprah Winfrey, then a TV anchor in Baltimore, Maryland. The two formed a close bond with Angelou becoming a mentor to the future media mogul. In 1981, Angelou made a significant move back to the southern United States. She felt a compelling need to come to terms with her past on her home ground. Angelou's fame reached new heights in 1993 when she recited her poem On the Pulse of Morning at President Bill Clinton's inauguration. This performance not only brought her more recognition, but also expanded her appeal across racial, economic, and educational boundaries. Her recitation even won her a Grammy Award. In 1995, Angelou delivered her second public poem titled A Brave and Starling Truth, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the United Nations. She created a collection of products for Hallmark, including greeting cards and decorative household items. When critics accused her of being too commercial, she defended herself, stating that this venture aligned perfectly with her role as a people's poet. In 2002, more than 30 years after she started writing her life story, Angelou completed her sixth autobiography, A Song Flung Up to Heaven. This period of Angelou's life was indeed a testament to her extraordinary talent and relentless drive to express her creativity in a myriad of ways. Angelou did not earn a university degree, but according to Gillespie, it was Angelou's preference to be called Dr. Angelou by people outside of her family and close friends. And she took that so serious <laughs> that she checked a girl, well, you know, let me show y'all the clip. Yeah, I wanted to ask Maya her views on interracial relationship. Oh, thank you. And first, I'm Miss Angelo. Miss Angelo. Yes, ma'am. I'm not Maya. I'm 62 years old. <laughs> I have lived so long and tried so hard that a young woman like you or any other has no license to come up to me and call me by my first name. Also, because at the same time, I am your mother. I'm your auntie. I'm your teacher. I'm your professor. You see? Yeah. So if you were addressing her or talking to her, you had to refer to her as Dr. Angelou. OK. OK. In 2013, marking another milestone at the age of 85, Maya Angelou unveiled the seventh installment of her series of autobiographies. This one titled Mom and Me and Mom delved into the intricate dynamics of her relationship with her mother. Angelou had a unique writing routine also that she stuck to for many years. She would rise early and head to a hotel room she checked into for the day. The staff was instructed to remove any artwork from the walls to create a distraction-free environment. Armed with legal pads, a bottle of sherry, rosettes, thesaurus, a Bible, and a deck of cards for solitaire games, she would write while lounging on the bed. By early afternoon, she'd have about 10 to 12 pages of content, which she would later trim down to just three or four pages. When writing, Angela would mentally transport herself back to the time she was right describing, even when it involved revisiting painful memories like her, you know, being taken advantage of as a child, as detailed in I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. She called this process telling the human truth about her life. And playing cards with herself was a tool she used to reach a state of enchantment that helped her access her memories more vividly. 
And in some Caribbean cultures, they do use those things. So I, you know, cards spiritually get you back to a place. I put you in a trance. So that was interesting when I read that about her, like, hmm, she, and she uses the word to enchant herself a lot. So maybe to put her in a trance and really take her back take her back there you know she'd say it may take an hour to get into it but once I'm in it ha it's so delicious end quote however she didn't view writing as a cathartic process instead she found relief in expressing the truth on the morning of May 28 2014 the world lost an extraordinary woman Maya Angelou at the age of 86 passed away leaving behind a legacy that would continue to inspire generations and despite her declining health and having to cancel several appearances Angelou remained a force of nature working on another book at the time of her death. This new autobiography was said to recount her encounters with prominent national and world leaders. News of her passing sparked an outpouring of tributes and condolences from around the world. Among those who mourned her loss were President Obama, who had a personal connection to Angelou as his sister was named after her, and former President Bill Clinton. Artists and entertainers also paid their respects, highlighting Angelou's broad influence across various fields. And in the week following her death, Angelou's most famous work, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, climbed to number one on Amazon. However, Angelou's work, particularly I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, wasn't without controversy. Some parents took issue after her death with the book's contents, like they were you know, trying to have it removed from schools, curriculums and libraries. And according to the National Coalition Against Censorship, objections were raised over the book's depictions of lesbianism, premarital cohabitation, you know, corn, corn, just replace that with a P, and violence. Critics also pointed out the sensually explicit scenes, language use and irreverent portrayals of religion. Despite these controversies, Angelou's contribution to literature and society were widely recognized. She received numerous honors, including a Pulitzer Prize nomination for her poetry books, Just Give Me a Cool Drink of Water, Before I Die, a Tony Award nomination for her role in the 1973 play, Look Away, and three Grammys for her spoken word albums. She served on two presidential committees and was awarded the Spingarn Medal in 1994 and the National Medal of Arts in 2000 and the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2000. 2011. Instead of asking you guys to leave flower emojis in the comments for her, I'm going to ask you guys to leave a pen writing emoji, pen and paper, or the writing hand emoji in the comments because she was a writer above all and a prolific one at that, okay? So that's what we're going to leave in the comment section for her. And I know you're a real one if you leave that emoji too because you watch until the, uh, the end. Please thumbs up. If you like the music you're listening to in the background, the link is in the description. I love you guys so much. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time.